time are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15 and verse 4. Romans 15 and verse 5 identifies God as the God of patience and consolation, a God of comfort. We can look back to the Old Testament, the things written before time, and we can gain comfort through that. We could gain knowledge. We can gain insight into how God dealt with man. We could gain insight on what God expected of men. We could gain insight on God's faithfulness, His immutable nature that He cannot possibly fail. We can look back and see all the times that God promised man and how God fulfilled His promises. And it gives us comfort, and rightfully so. We're going to look this morning in Psalm chapter 2. And if you have an outline, we have some in the back. If you don't have one, you're, you're, it's not necessary. You can just open your Bibles to Psalm 2. And we're going to study. We'll probably only get the first three verses this time. But we want to look at those. And we want to make some, uh, bring out some truths in the text. We want to see what is being taught. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about some, uh, uh, some other implications of that as it relates especially to some of the doctrines that are being promoted today. Paul would write to Timothy and he would tell him, preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine but having itching ears will heap unto themselves teachers after their own lusts and they will turn their ears aside from the truth and turn into fables. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. Paul writing to the same evangelist would say in 2 Timothy 3, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, uh, complete, truly furnished unto all good works. So we understand from God's word that God's word is the standard. Jesus would say unto men, Whosoever rejecteth me and receiveth not my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. God's word is the standard. God's word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. Psalm 119. God's word is the standard. God's word is the, is the, the standard that we must conform to. In writing to those in Rome... Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Verse 29. So we must understand that God's Word has given us as a standard, and we must learn it and apply it in our lives. We must handle it properly, as Paul would write to Timothy also in his second epistle in chapter 2 and verse 15, saying, Give diligence. Or study to present thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Handling aright or rightly dividing the word of truth. So we've got to dive into it. We've got to make application of it. We've got to make effort to understand it and apply it in our lives. Okay? Now by the way, if there are any questions about anything, when the service is over, I'll be in the back. If you have any questions, any comments, please ask. Uh, we would be happy to address those. If you want to study something further, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to do it. I'll do it with you. It doesn't matter what the topic is. If it's a biblical topic, I'll study it with you. Uh, if you are uncomfortable studying with someone else and you want to study with someone, I'll go with you. Uh, I, I've got visitors here. I, I don't really know all of you. I know some of you. I'll go with you anyway. doesn't bother me a bit. That's what we're supposed to do, aren't we? We're supposed to try to, to spread the gospel of our Lord and help any uh, uh, inaccuracies and get people on the right track. That's what we want to do. So let's open our Bibles to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder. And cast away their cords from us. Now, it's interesting and it's, it's, it's important for us as we read a text to be careful of the application of the text. I'll give you an example. In Acts chapter 2, Peter begins in verse 16 and he preaches the first gospel sermon in the name of the resurrected Christ to those Pentecostians. They were Jews there on the day of Pentecost, and he was preaching Jesus to them. And he makes application of a specific phrase that is widely misused and abused today. The throne of David. Ask any various friend or neighbor of yours. Perhaps they're not members of the church. That's, that's okay. We want to help them. 
Ask them what it means to, to Jesus to ascend to the throne of David. They'll say, well, when, did, when the Lord returns, he's going to set up a kingdom for a thousand years. And then there's going to be a seven-year tribulation time. And then he's going to reign on earth. No, he's not. That simply isn't what the Bible teaches. So when Peter uses a phrase like throne of David, and Peter is an inspired apostle, what should you do? Pay attention. Peter says... Uh, he sings the four spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. The same Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we're all witnesses. Therefore, being on the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear, Acts 2, 27 through 30. He says right before that, that he would raise up Christ to sit on his, David's throne. So when we have Peter use a phrase like throne of David, or David's throne, and he makes application to that being Jesus' resurrection and ascension to the Father, that settles it. We don't get to say, well, I think it really means. It doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what God says, right? We can understand that. So, we need to try to make understanding or understand where we find ourselves in Psalm 2. What is the purpose of the psalm? Do we have any other writings from inspired men concerning this that would help us make proper application of it? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 25. Listen to what inspiration says about Psalm 2. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Notice how inspiration makes application of Psalm 2 to Jesus Christ and the opposition that he would face. Now this brings us to an interesting question. And we're going to see it again in a minute. Why is it that various religious groups teach that when the Lord returns, there's going to be a utopia on earth. I talked to some Jehovah's Witnesses uh, a while back, and they were saying, isn't it going to be great whenever the Lord returns and we have a one world government and there's peace on earth? And I'm like, you've missed it. You've missed the reign of Christ. He's been reigning since Acts chapter 2. He's been on the right hand of God exalted since then. Matthew 28, 18 says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is King Jesus. And if there's King Jesus, there's a kingdom which he rules over. And he's been ruling since Acts 2. We've missed something. There's no utopia on earth. Notice that it, it talks about the time in which there would be a kingdom on earth. There will always be opposition to it. It is not ever going to be a utopia on earth. Folks, we're never returning to Eden. We have earth as it is, and it will remain this way until the earth is no more. And then we will be with our Father and our Savior in heaven, and then there will be wonderful things and no bad things, won't there? But while we're on earth, we're going to have this. There's not going to be some time on earth where there's perfect harmony and everything's hunky-dory and there's no violence or oppression or death. It's just not going to happen. The entire time of the kingdom would be a time in which there would be opposition and tribulation. There would be difficulties. The psalm deals with God's anointed. Did you notice that a minute ago? In the psalm, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And look at what inspiration says. Against the Lord and His Christ. Jesus is the anointed one, is He not? Acts chapter 2, therefore being, uh, verse 33, therefore being on the right hand of God exalted, right? Verse 34, for David himself saith, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make all thine enemies thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2, 35 and 36. There's no disputing on who Jesus is. Is he is the anointed one? Acts four seven says, "For of a truth against thy holy." Excuse me. Acts four twenty seven. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. We know who he's talking about. Who is the anointed one of Psalm two? Acts ten thirty eight. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Hebrews one nine. 
the Father saying to the Son, For thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above all thy fellow. Who is the anointed one if not Jesus the Christ? The heathens and rulers rebel against his authority. Verse 3. Not some utopia on earth. The kingdom of God will ever be spoken against and oppressed. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 for just a moment. As Paul is speaking about the resurrection. And notice what he says beginning in verse number 24. <coughs> then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Let me ask you a question. Are there any enemies of the Lord today? Let's look back in the, in, in the previous century or so. Would you say that Adolf Hitler was an enemy to righteousness and decency? I would think killing six million innocent people would, would qualify, don't you? So there are still enemies, is that correct? There's still opposition. What about uh, uh, various doctrines that teach that it's okay to cut people's heads off? Is that something that, that may be opposed to decency and righteousness, to, to oppose to God and His will? Absolutely. So there are still enemies, and obviously the implication is Jesus is still reigning. He must reign until every opposition is put down. And it says there's going to be one, finally, that will be conquered also. Death. Now I've got some friends that a couple of years ago, they went off into error... And they teach that Jesus returned in A.D. 70 and that the resurrection happened in A.D. 70 and the judgment happened in A.D. 70 and Hades was emptied in A.D. 70. They teach that the kingdom was delivered to the Father in A.D. 70. And I still haven't heard a really good, reasonable explanation of verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death because my dad died. It'll be a, a next week in 2008. The 13th of October, he died in 2008 of lung cancer. And I miss dad, right? We, we, want, we want our loved ones back that are gone. So the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Well, well, last time I checked, 2019 is after 70 AD. And the last time I checked, physical death is still going on. So it must imply then, according to their doctrine, spiritual death, which is universalism, by the way. And guess what? That's false too. They'll say, well, actually, it's the implications of death. It's the consequences of spiritual death were taken care of in Christ. Well, that was taken care of in A.D. 30, not A.D. 70. So we still fail. So there is opposition to God, and there will always be opposition to God until the very end. Finally, when all of this is done, there will be no more opposition, and we will be in eternity with our Father for the faithful. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thought? It's nothing new, is it? All you got to do is, is, is get this glorious book, the Bible, and open it to the first page. God created man. God created man in His image, Genesis 1.27. God created man very good, Genesis 1.31. But God created man a volitional being. That is, God created man with a choice. Man was able to choose to reciprocate God's love by loving Him back. Or man could choose to do whatever else he wanted to. And we see that man has always and will always. And when I say man, I don't mean every man. I mean that it's a, it's a consistent theme across mankind. Man doesn't like to submit to authority. I remember a certain Pharaoh, a king, asking in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2. As Moses was sent to Pharaoh to tell him to let the people of God go, Pharaoh would say, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And you know what's interesting is that God told him who he was, but he didn't say it. He didn't articulate it in words. Rather, he continued to, uh, to give him the opportunity to repent or to harden himself further with the various plagues that were sent upon this nation. And finally, after the Passover and the firstborn of every, uh, of every man and beast uh, died that night, they let the people go and as you see Pharaoh hardening his heart further and getting angry and getting his military might and chasing these men down and you see God destroy them in the Red Sea and in Exodus 15 as the bodies of these men wash up to the feet of the children of Israel they would sing a song saying who is like unto thee O Lord Pharaoh said who is the Lord that I should obey well Jehovah God answered with power Man will always rebel against God, won't he? That's what man does. 
Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Don't we understand that we're not, it's not good enough? I've had this conversation a lot of times, and a lot of times you have really honest, sincere people asking really honest, sincere questions. And you know what you should do? You, you should consider what they say and give them an honest, sincere answer. Never look at it as there, there are no stupid questions. There's no such animal. But when someone would ask a question and say, well, why is it the good, decent, moral people? Why is it the good, decent, moral people will be lost? Well, the, well, the question is, who gets to decide what's good? Let's say that, I, that I, I sin one time. I commit one act of sin. And then I spend the rest of my life building hospitals and feeding the hungry and providing for the poor and, and, and being a, a, a foster parent to children. And I cure cancer. And I move mountains. I've not done one thing to remove the one sin in my life. We are not good enough. We need Jesus. Or else Jesus died in vain. Matthew 26 and verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for the remission of sins. We need that blood. And you or I are not good enough. It doesn't mean that you're not a decent person. It means that you're not good enough to save yourself. Proverbs 28 verse 26. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walks wisely, he shall be delivered. Trusting in our own heart in, in matters pertaining to salvation. Well, I feel I should do this. But the Bible very clearly says do this. When you're at odds with very clear passages of Scripture, please consider that you're not right and God is. Well, I feel that I can do this in worship. I feel that God blessed me with musical ability. Why can't I glorify God by picking a banjo in worship service? Because God didn't ask you for it. What makes you think that just because you've been blessed with talent, you can use it any old way, especially in light of contradicting God's plain scriptures? Don't you think that it would rather glorify God by you using your ability in some other way, but simply doing what He asked you to do? Isn't that faith? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Genesis 6.22 says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Hebrews 11 and verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things yet to be seen, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah did what God said, therefore Noah glorified God. Not by adding his little two cents or taking away here. God says, If you love me, you do what I tell you. John 14.15 Man always rebels against God. Man hardly ever wants to humble himself. There are humble folks in, in, in the world, aren't there? Yes, there are. And there are some that are not. Arrogant and prideful. James chapter 4 would say, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. What is humility? The very first sermon Jesus preached, recorded for us in the New Testament, is in Matthew 5. He preaches it for three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's the sermon that we all refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And you know the first words out of His mouth? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, he's not talking about this guy's blessed. Oh, and this guy over here is also blessed. Oh, and that fell in the back. He's blessed too. No, that's one person. That is a character of the kingdom citizen. That is speaking of this kingdom person is mourning over sin. This kingdom person is cognizant of their condition without God. This kingdom person is humble enough to acknowledge these and acknowledge that he needs God in his life. Blessed are the meek. Isn't that the same concept as humility? We recognize self especially in light of self without God and our need for Him? Who's humble but he that hears God's will and submits to it faithfully? Is that not humility? Is humility saying, Oh God, well, uh, it's, it's not going to be any use. You can't save me anyway, so I'll just go on and do my own thing. That's the opposite of humility. Humility is saying, God, yes, I need you. What must I do to be saved? And then hearing His inspired Word, the Scripture speaking to you as you read it or as someone says... Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Who were the humble on Pentecost? Was it not the 3,000 that obeyed Acts 
Who are the humble today? Those that surrender to His will and the obedience of faith. Where's my trust if I hear what God says and I simply do it? Where was Naaman's trust? 2 Kings 5. Naaman was a mighty man of Syria, wasn't he? We've all heard of Naaman. We have a little thing here sometimes. We'll say, verse 11, Behold, I thought. Well, guess what, Naaman? You thought wrong, didn't you? Naaman expected the, the, the servant of the Lord to come out and strike his hand upon the leper and call on the name of his Lord and he'd be healed. But the, 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 the prophet didn't even come. The prophet sent his servant to Naaman. And the servant tells Naaman, Hey, go to the Jordan River and wash seven times. Oh. Well, that's a little below me. I'm a mighty man of Syria. I'm a captain of the host. I'm a warrior. I expected you to have me do something mighty. No. Well, that's a, that's a, a stumbling block to some apparently, isn't it? What you expect of me, God, is not what I expected. Therefore, we have a problem. The only problem is your lack of humility. All you've got to do is humble yourself and understand that what God says goes. Acts 2.21 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How can you call on the name of the Lord? What does that mean? It's simple. You look to Him to save you through His authority. And Jesus is the one that said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's His will. So Acts 2.21 is fulfilled in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized. That is obedience to the gospel. That doesn't mean say a prayer to be saved. It means look to the Lord's authority to save you by doing what He told you to do. Rebellion against God is nothing new, is it? In Acts 2.23, Peter is preaching to those folks on the day of Pentecost. And I want to make a point to you that while God was in heaven, man rebelled against God. And then when God was on earth, man rebelled against God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. They crucified the Son of God. They killed Him. You know what people say today? Oh, if Jesus was alive today, if Jesus was alive today, He'd be a supporter of this and that, baloney. No, He would not. You'd kill Him quicker than they did. That's what would happen. He wouldn't last three years today. These folks have lost their minds with the stuff that they're advocating today. And the first time he said, it's my way or the highway, John 14, 6, they'd call him a racist and a bigot, just like they call everybody else. And they'd lock him up, they'd, they'd kill him. Folks, it isn't bigotry or racism to simply tell you the truth as God has revealed it in his word. I'm sorry, it's not. Luke chapter 4. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these sayings, they were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. Oh man, Jesus must have really let them have it. Do you know what he said in Luke 4? That's Luke's first account of him going in the synagogue and, and preaching to people. And you know what he says to them? He says God, basically, he shows them that God had not always just wanted you to be saved. He wanted to offer it to everyone else. He said that there was only one rose from the dead. And that was the widow's son in Sarepta. And he was a Gentile. And there was only one clear uh, cured of leprosy in the Old Testament. And that was Naaman, a non-Jew. So because God extended this blessedness to non-Jews, they wanted to try to throw him off a cliff. You're talking about people hating the truth. It's the same today. You think Jesus would have insulted them. He didn't insult them. All he did was tell them the truth. And he just told them, that, hey, God has always wanted to extend salvation to someone other than just this physical nation. Oh, that's crazy. <coughs> what are we talking about? Rebellion. Man is always and will always rebel from God. They, that, that's just the way that man chooses to be. God didn't make you this way. Let me, let me give you something to think about. If God made you rebellious and then punishes you for being rebellious, then God isn't just. God didn't make you rebellious. You remember Genesis 131? God made man very good. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 that man is made upright. Paul says that man is the image and glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So no, don't tell me that man is depraved and nasty and a filthy little sinner. No, you're not. You're made good. You're made Isaiah 43 to glorify God. That's your purpose on earth. And he gave you every faculty to do it. You simply choose to do otherwise. So no, don't tell me that God made you a rebellious creature and then punishes you for being rebellious. He absolutely did not. He made you a good upright creature and you've learned rebellion. Now you must unlearn it and learn obedience. That's where we have to be. And the scribes and the chief priest heard it and sought how they might destroy him. Oh, they hated him. Man rebelled against God when God was in heaven. And then when God came to earth, they rebelled against him yet again. 
Thus, as in harmony with this psalm, the reign of Christ would not be some utopia on earth, but a time of persecution and opposition. Listen to what Paul says. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered, thee, uh, delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, every once in a while, if you do what's right, you might suffer a little. Nope. If you live godly, you're going to suffer. You might be like, well, I'm not really suffering. Well, maybe you need to change your life. Not that we're looking for suffering, but we need to understand that when we do right, we're going to stand op uh, in opposition to most things. And that's okay. You know what's cool? You're not alone. In the body of Christ, we're all trying to stand for what's right. And we'll stand with you, won't we? Absolutely. Job 14, 1, man is born of woman a few days and he's full of trouble. 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ, after that you've suffered for a while, will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Yes, we're going to suffer in this life. And once again, folks, the kingdom period is a time of persecution. The, 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 the reign of Christ is a time in which there will be opposition. And the reign of Christ has been in effect since Acts 2 and will continue until the end of the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. So are we going to suffer in this life? Sure. But we're studying 1 Peter on Sunday mornings in the Bible study. And Peter has, in four chapters, iterated four different times the obligation and the admonition to remain faithful during fierce persecutions because we have a home in heaven. And if we keep that in mind, we can get through the difficulties that we face. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend the invitation to any here this morning. Maybe just a case that you've never obeyed the gospel. Listen, please. The Bible says that in order to be saved, you must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17. It is the word of faith. Romans 10, 8. You must believe in Jesus Christ. John 20, 31 and 19, 35 says we can believe in Christ through his inspired word. We must repent of our sins. Acts 17, and verse 30. That is a change in will. I've changed my mind about sin and now my actions also change. I must confess Christ before men. Romans 10.10, 10, confession is with the mouth and it goes towards salvation. And I must be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. For in baptism, that is when we contact the blood of Jesus. Colossians 2, 12 and 13. It's when we're added to the one and only church. Acts 2.47. And it's when we're saved from our sins. 1 Peter 3.21. And we must remain faithful. Having been born into the kingdom, let's remain there, giving heed to the teachings of King Jesus and doing His will. 1 John 1, 6 through 10, Romans 8, 1 through 6. For those who have obeyed the gospel, what if you're not faithful? What if you recognize that you used to be and you're not anymore? Change your mind. God has given you another day to repent. Please do so. Acknowledge your sin in prayer to God. He'll forgive you if you're an erring member. If you need the prayers of the church, we'll offer prayers for you. 1 John 5, 16 says, If you're willing to repent, God is willing to forgive. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. If any have need, we would encourage you to come forward and let us know your needs. And we will provide for you uh, whatever the Bible says is necessary. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.